Welcome today again to the AI for EU Café. We are an online web café giving presentations around AI. Today we have a speaker, Jean-Luc Dormois from Hub IA in Paris. Welcome, Jean-Luc. And he will present us. The title is Leveraging the Impact of AI in Europe. My name is Carmen McWilliams. I'm your host and I'm the organizer of this online cafe. And please notice that this session will be recorded. The recording will be after this live session available on the AI for you website. Later, I will give you the link. Please don't share any confidential information in this cafe session. And also in this, the cafe speaker expresses his opinion. It is not the official project view. So have fun. And what is the AI cafe? as a little introduction. And it is basically a public space and public means like anybody is enjoy allowed to join and it gives insight in European AI scene, shares knowledge and experience, and you can meet stakeholders from various areas of AI. In this case, Jean-Luc Dommel. And Jean-Luc is a founder of the Hub IA. He will tell us more about it very soon. He has worked in research institutions, large companies and startups. He's a co-founder of Colray, of Vesta System and senior advisor of Irene, and he was director for smart electric systems for the EDF group in Europe and was in charge of software programs at CEA Tech. He is now involved in startups, accelerators, and initiatives for startups, cyber physical systems, AI, and smart energy in EU, and he has a PhD in AI. So I think very qualified speaker today. I'm very happy to welcome you. Now I give over to our presenter. And after the session, there will be a Q&A. If you have questions, please enter them in your panel on the right side. You see questions, you can type them anytime in. I will read them after the presentation or during the presentation. And John luc will try to answer them. So now I'm giving over to Jean-Luc, the panel. Jean-Luc, I gave it to you. Thank you, Carmen. So not only now you should see a donkey, it's not I... me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's going to be, uh, he's going to be, it's going to be invited next time. I don't know whether it's going to be interesting or not. But my presentation is going to be this one. Okay. So thank you uh, uh, for being there. And thank you, Carmen, for inviting me. Um, what I'm going to expose is a set of uh, uh, personal views, uh, I would say, gathered after a life of uh, devoted to research and innovation. So you mentioned the French OBR, uh, which I've been involved in, uh, but this is personal view, mainly. Uh, the main topic is, uh, what is the impact of AI on the economy? Is it really a big impact or just a moderate impact? And uh, uh, where are we going? Not prediction, but what might be possible? And then what should we do? What should we do? So first of all, I would like to mention something, the sad events. Uh, it's about Jack Pitra, maybe some of you know him, uh, and some don't. Uh, he was one of the pioneers of artificial general intelligence in the 60s, and he passed away last week. Uh, he made absolutely fantastic things. Uh, in particular, he worked on what maybe some people call today singularity, but from a very different point of view. He called that the bootstrapping problem. I won't spend much time about this, but this was a very, very sad event. And you know, he was 
one of the few really important people. I remember once coming into his office uh, with a document on his desk and uh, a short written letter. Uh, Dear Jacques, uh, this is my last PhD student's letters. I would be very grateful if you gave me your opinion. You sincerely, Alan Nouveau. So he was among this small group of people at that time. Side events, but now we are going to talk about the future. So when, when I present what's happening in AI to um, uh, the tenants made up of people not uh, 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 familiar with AI, what I said is, well, you know, it's very simple what's happening. In fact, it's not. With the first industrial revolution, large-scale energy became abundant. With the second one, that is cars, oil, train, electricity, and so on, small-scale, mobile, and flexible energy became abundant. But intelligence kept being a scarce resource. With the AI revolution, intelligence is becoming abundant. So what might be happening is that there is a kind of no input, or maybe some, people, some economists talk about human capital, but it means intelligence, that has been scarce up to now in, in the history of humanity. And suddenly, at least under some form, is becoming abundant. So this is the, the true picture, not just a metaphor for introducing the topic, then the consequences might be absolutely tremendous, and we should look at that. So let's call it the AI revolution. I don't mean that I'm absolutely sure that this is what's happening, but that might be happening. So just to summarize what I just said, okay, uh, before the industrial revolution, you had maybe the craftsman, okay, you had many peasants, but the, the, the person who resettled most to what we do today was the craftsman. He had very little energy at his disposal, but he had much, much intelligence. Suddenly, with the first industrial revolution, we had much energy in large quantity, the steam engine, and we used very little intelligence. In fact, you know, in factories, people were all doing the same job and in a very stupid way. With the second industrial revolution, something was invented. It was made possible because it was possible to make more flexible uh, 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 manufacturing procedures. So it's the procedure. That is a set of actions which are ordered by an initial plan uh, 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 which is applied during production. It was Fordism and then it was applied to the whole economy and uh, it's terrorism and then, you know, uh, what applied to GM, for example, by Sloan and to the whole corporate world. Then came IT, and IT, uh, uh, in fact, has its origin in that. Uh, of course, everybody knows Turing, okay, and his model of a computer, but there, was, uh, there were other uh, competing models, for example, Post's model. Emil Post was a Polish uh, um, uh, logician, and he imagined an equivalent model to Turing's, uh, based on the worker while he was working, the model of the procedure in the Fordist organization. So from that came software and IT. And IT made it possible to uh, encrypt this intelligence into something automatic in machines. That's software. But nevertheless, though IT uh, uh, um, now is absolutely everywhere, the level of intelligence that was embedded in that remained limited. So, to come back uh, uh, and summarize with the first industrial revolution, we have a unique, simple process for massive production and few engineers and massive, what we call at that time, proletariat. With the second industrial revolution, we have a unique, complex process for massive production, more engineers and other corporate functions, massive training. That is, we try to raise the level of intelligence available through training people and welfare which was so part of that, and procedures. And in the IT world, we still have a unique complex process for massive production. We have more engineers and other corporate functions, et cetera, plus today global economy and software. Because, you know, um, some people, of course, it's always easy to summarize uh, uh, history, but some people say that, in a sense, the rise of China is the alliance of IBM and Walmart, you know? Uh, a retailer in the US and the capacity to organize information through IT made it possible to organize production in China 
And from that, the government in China took advantage to build China to the level we know today. So if we look back at this history, we have now some opinions which are very interesting. The first one was given by Tyler Cowen, who wrote a book in 2011 in the US. It was one of the best bestseller in the US, in the NYT, in the New York Times uh, list. It's the, the Great Stagnation. Since then, he has written other books. So his assumption is that, in fact, the, the rate of, of innovation has dramatically slowed down since the 1970s, since the kind of end of impact, full impact, of the second industrial revolution. Of course, we have IT, but uh, uh, IT is still limited to a small domain, and the bulk of the economy is, is based on the second industrial revolution. So, uh, in fact, this is coherent with what we see in the economy, with the productivity, which is slowing down, and so on. There was, at the same time, another, another man, Robert Garden, who is a professor at the university, I don't remember where, where. he just published a, a paper for, for a committee from the federal state, but this paper, which was supposed to not to go beyond uh, academic limits, uh, will suddenly became uh, um, public and, and very much discussed. It's, is US innovation over and faltering innovation confronts the six headwinds? I won't come into the details of that because I don't have time, but he's saying about the same, okay? In fact, innovation has uh, not stopped, but slowed down since the 1970s, and Haiti has not added much to that. So if we look at, at the figures, and also the, all the kinds of ideas, uh, at the weight of the IT economy today, in the US, it's about 8% of the economy. In the EU, 6%. The difference is probably uh, the difference in uh, software editors and today platforms and so on. And the average in the world is between 4 and 5%. Okay? So it means if we add that to 100%, that the rest, that is 92% in the US, 94% uh, in the EU and so on, uh, is the old economy not exactly the old economy, but the economy which is based on the technological principles of the second industrial revolution. So in a sense, you know, some people uh, say radical things or provocative things such as Europe is a developing country in IT. That might be true in some sense, in a limited sense, but it's a global power globally, okay, because of that. And if you look at the FANG, the GAFAS business model, well, it's mainly advertising. And advertising is not really revolutionary because what they are selling is the mass products and services from the formal revolution, the formal industrial revolution. So IT is everywhere, but like Solo said, Solo was a Nobel Prize in economy. He used to say, well, IT is everywhere except in the figures for productivity. He said that in 1987, okay? And even Greenspan's new ec economy, it was during the internet bubble in the 1990s up to 2002. Greenspan, who was the Fed chairman, used to say, we have a new economy. You see, productivity is raising first, thanks to IT, this stopped. Okay? So we are more or less in that situation. This is the second assumption, okay, that uh, uh, we are still basically in the same principles in terms of technology at the second industrial revolution, and IT has to change the situation. So now the question is, is AI going to change that landscape? So what has changed? What is AI? Okay, AI today is mainly machine learning. Okay, so everybody knows that. And in fact, maybe we should consider AI as a way to build software. Up to now, software was built by humans. So either uh, experts, like in expert systems when I was young, or large engineering organizations, like, I don't know, uh, when you, you make the software which is embedded in the car, it's very huge organizations which make huge pieces of software embedded in the cars, millions of lines of code, tens of millions of lines of code. So the process is that you take the complexity of the world, and this is processed by human beings, and they produce software. It turns out that humans are not very good at producing software. Okay? 
Personally, when I was a researcher, I worked on that, how to improve the productivity of software, in particular to make more, more complex software. If you take the advances which have been made, I was mentioning the engineering organization, for example, in the automotive industry, or more generally or in what we call the cyber physical systems, uh, uh, there were also advances made, but not in principle. With machine learning, we have something different. We invented now efficient algorithms which make it possible to take the complexity of the world in the form of data and to, and to transform it into software, meaningful software. Of course, it's not only fully automatic, it's the alliance between some designers, human designers, and uh, those machine learning algorithms. Okay? And it turns out that, at least in some domains, the complexity of the generated software is much, much higher. Uh, this is maybe not well known, but you know, the, 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 the Go programs that were designed by, by DeepMind uh, uh, now are much, much better than the best human at Pay Go. Uh, they were the first version which has beaten the world champion, the second version which has beaten the Chinese champion, and there is a third version which is so much better than the four versions that it's non-human. So, uh, the second point, which is important, is to say that AI and machine learning probably has become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, what do I mean by that? Okay, there were some advances, but of course, we don't know yet them fully, but there are probably some limits to these advances which have just been made in, in machine learning. To go forward, we need more people working in the domain, fine brains working in the domain. But this is happening. This is happening for a number of reasons. Essentially, for the reasons which are how is the world organized today and what are the main trends. If you take the, the United States, okay, they are fighting to keep their leading role. And the three major domains where the US have a leading role are technology, particular chip, chip making, energy, finance, and international trade, and the reserve currency, that is the dollar. Okay? And they need, they want to keep at the forefront of technology because this is what uh, uh, made their uh, uh, form of success possible. Okay? And artificial intelligence is among what they are heavily investing in with other things. So it means that the US, and we know that, are pouring many dollars and so attracting many fine brains in that. In the same for China, for the same reasons, in the sense that if the China uh, is willing to uh, 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 to be a competitor of the US on the three main points, technology, energy, and finance. And it turns out that they have programs to catch up in any domain in the long term. It's not only artificial intelligence, it's also, for example, the electric vehicle or putting a man on the moon. But it turns out, in particular, the, 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 the fact that uh, DeepMind was able to, 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 to make a, a fantastic AlphaGo program uh, which is considered by the Chinese population like the Chinese game, uh, made AI extremely popular. Kaifuri said that the, the second game against the Chinese champion was followed by 240 million people. That's absolutely crazy. And so we know now that there is much money poured into AI and five brains attractive. So now, what, what is the situation in Europe in the middle? So we know that uh, Europe is, say, let's say, hesitating about its role in its position. Uh, many people say, we should copy the way it is. Uh, we should keep the economy the way it is, the euro the way it is, welfare and democracy, and there are also questions about our neighbors, about sovereignty, and so on. We are still in the, at the forefront in many domains of science, engineering, and trade. This is the situation today. Nevertheless, the, 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 uh, the trend towards heavily investing and attracting Many brains in AI, like in the United States and China, has not happened yet in Europe. So now, if we try to look now at the future, not to predict the future, but to see the, the impact, possible impact of AI to the economy. If we take this, this is, roughly speaking, the, the, the French economy, you know, with the different sectors. I'm sorry, this is French, but if you know some French, you can understand it and you, you, you're trying to make some analysis, what you see is that, well, uh, uh, in, 19, in 2030, 
about one third of the economy could be deeply impacted by AI. Deeply means that the rules are going to change. Not the whole sector is going to change, but the rules, internal sectors are going to change. This is also what the Chinese say, okay? Well, of course, we are not obliged to believe them, but to say that up to, I don't remember whether it's 2025 or 2030, uh, uh, the rise of AI is, is going to produce a 25% uh, raise in, in productivity, which is enormous because you know what we're experiencing today is between one and two percent increase in productivity, not more. So uh, if we uh, look at the situation, we know, uh, and sorry, this slide is not very good, but we know that uh, this is going to be possible in particular through uh, uh, data. That is, we have to make data available. In the US, they have the GAFA. In China, they have Batix or Palantir. In Europe, we need something to do with that. So this is the first, uh, uh, I would say, facet of the impact. We are looking at the economy, the existing economy. We know that there is going, uh, going to be a tremendous impact, and we need to do something about it, in particular, gathering the data. And so very probably, building an infrastructure for doing that, because we don't have companies of the state, which is behind that. Uh, but now, this is probably not the only impact, because if it's such an important input in the economy, intelligence as compared to energy, as I was saying in the beginning, then uh, there might be also some disrupt, dis disruptive impact. So, you know, disrupting the word now, which is used by many persons. But what I mean is simply that new things are going to happen in the economy. So uh, uh, it's true that existing IT players start with some advantages, but also some drawbacks. So this is to compare this to the situation of Europe. They have access to some basic data. They know how to quickly uh, create adaptive services. They understand the verticals and draws in their DNA. DNA. That is, they need to get out of the purely bike-based economy. What I mean by that, they need to go outside of the 8% weight uh, uh, IT economy. But it turns out that matter and energy is hard. That is, to get out of these purely IT processes to make cars, to uh, uh, make delivery, to make retail, and so on, it's really hard. Because simply the word is there, you know, it's not going as fast as bytes, okay? So you need to learn uh, to design, to manufacture, you need to learn about logistics, etc. And also the business model of all these human activities, which are outside the pure scope of IT, is not a business model based on advertising. It's a business model based on selling uh, products and services. So if we look at the possible destructive impacts, I will uh, um, insist on, on the last two ones. First possible impact is to have, in some domains, radical deflations by embedding AI into existing products or making those products, new products, out of AI. So some examples, for example, modular or re reusable space traps, which is more or less what's happening with, uh, with, with, with SpaceX, though SpaceX is still in a very, I would say, primitive uh, uh, level of, of development with probably what, what's possible. If you think of last mile delivery or retail, where you fully automatize uh, everything, this is also a possibility to radically deflate the price of this kind of activity. You can think also of construction. You know, <laughs> I remember having a, a meeting with, with our, our British friends uh, at the embassy on what, what, what we could do together in, in AI. And I said, okay, let's build a bridge, uh, build a bridge uh, uh, over the channel. Because at this time, Boris Johnson used to say that we should do that. So I said, but just with robots, okay? Let's build robots, which should be able to build the bridge, fully to build the bridge. Uh, something radical in, in the way to build things. Okay, so we also have uh, new products and services, for example, the autonomous cars. I would like to insist to the two last one, the new B2C markets and new corporate organization. In particular, I would like to insist on B2C because what I heard uh, from discussions in Europe, the high-level group of experts on artificial intelligence and so on, 
uh, the outcome would be, uh, well, B2C is dead because it's already uh, uh, among the GAFAs and the BATIs. I believe it's totally wrong. If you take, for example, the application of AI to energy and more precisely to the power system, which is something that, uh, which I know, I, I was involved in that in the Nash company, I created two startups in that domain. Uh, we all know about the smart grid. It's a word which was coined 15 years ago, uh, and there have been some advances in that. Basically, what's going to happen is that intelligence is going to come to the end. Today, the power system is controlled by intelligence uh, in the middle, and it's going to be to the end. So we are going to have millions, billions of small autonomous AIs which are going to deal with everything, with energy, with information, with money, with the people, okay? And they are going to talk to each other and to a new central business. This is a B2C business, okay? And of course, the B2C model is not based on advertising, it's based on the exchange of cheap intelligence against expressive energy. So totally different. And I believe that this is an open domain where Europe could go. Just another example, I believe I got to hurry up. Uh, the impact on corporate organization. This is a picture that I like for <laughs> discussing uh, with, with startup how to organize things. You know, it, the main functions, there are many such, such, such schemas, but the main functions are, are of a company and the startup should uh, at some point achieve this kind of organization. Okay? The people who are involved in that corporate organization are just doing a small limited things, you know, it's division of labor. But there might be a different organizations. Because today we have key functions, processes, main decision is at the center, long cycles of decisions, years for a new product or service, for example. And so the people may use, they are allowed to use the intelligence, but within the limits of the process. I met once a smart driver, a smart taxi driver. I don't remember, it was Bolt, Marcel, or Uber, whatever. That guy was very really smart. He has managed to assemble a set of smart services for his professional activity. He was not devoted to a single platform. Even he was doing something different while driving a taxi. He had also assembled services for finance, for uh, provision, provisioning his car. He was playing a game of multi-platform. He has almost found a way to automatically manage his agenda uh, so as to uh, 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 cope with his personal constraints you know, with, with, with the kids and so on, and, and to optimize his revenues. So this guy, in fact, has totally destroyed the, 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 the corporate view. So when engaged in a large organization, he put together around him the main processes of a corporation. He is a corporation by himself. So this is probably something which is going to happen. Of course, the way it's going to happen is important. Is it going to be a generalization of the gig economy? or something which, which is going to provide work with many, okay? And there are signs uh, uh, of that, you know, something which has existed for, for quite some time is network marketing, for people who know marketing. Or if you look at uh, uh, the paper written by Eric Schmidt on how Google works, this is something also, also which is happening. Small teams directly connecting engineering technology and the market. So, uh, the last point I would like to mention, so I said impact on the existing economy, impact on the new economy, so to speak, and also impact on basic technology. Uh, we were discussing with Carmen, uh, Carmen uh, just before the, this talk, and she was telling me that her daughter is much involved in, you know, helping the planet to, uh, to be in better shape and so on. The young people want that want that, and they are absolutely right to do that, okay? Uh, I believe that what we have today is, is that uh, we, we are lacking also some basic technology, not only in IT and AI, but in all the other domains to uh, really tackle these issues. This is probably not the only thing to do, but technology can bring some solutions to that. So I believe that the alliance with AI, and there are many examples of that popping up today, but basic science could provide new, some new basic technology. So at all domains in physics, in chemistry, in biology, I'm thinking in particular of, of uh, synthetic biology, that could bring new materials, new energy, new health, and so on.
So this is the third pillar, I would say. So now from that, I've got to hurry up. Uh, how should Europe organize itself? So I believe that there are three pillars. The first one is to have some, in of course, it's just a schema. I don't mean that it's three different instruments. It's just an idea for the discussion. So the first one is to have instruments for the existing economy, to help the existing economy to face the uh, upcoming impact of AI. This concerns large groups and SMEs, and basically it's about research and innovation projects. Okay, uh, I will say a, a word afterwards about that. The second one is to have an instrument for the new economy. And we know that in Europe we are not very good up to now uh, regarding that, that, that sector. So it's mainly about startups, but I believe that startups are, are, are going to be slightly different from what they've been up to, to now. Uh, and in particular, what will have to be done, because what I said before, you know, it's really linked to the 92% of, of the existing economy, which has to deal with matter and energy. Uh, the relation of startups with large companies and, and SME, that is with the existing uh, economy, which has many of the resources required to be successful in that, the market, the knowledge of the customer, uh, 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 the knowledge of how to do manufacturing, logistics, and so on. Uh, the, this relationship between startups and the large companies is absolutely key to succeed. If you look, for example, just to mention it, you know, uh, at Shenzhen, uh, uh, I have a friend, a very good friend, who was leading a, a laboratory in AI and how to uh, assess uh, or to certify AI for uh, the autonomous car just in the middle of Shenzhen. Okay, they have every relation with whomever they want, Tencent, of course, but all those companies and all these car systems in Shenzhen to make uh, an autonomous car and a very innovative one. So the last one, as I was mentioning it, is the instrument for new basic technology using AI. And I believe there maybe the RTOs, you know, the research technology kind of organizations, could find uh, uh, something uh, uh, very interesting to do, which might be uh, uh, slightly different from what they've been doing up to now and, and very interesting. And this would be of course, of course linked to deep tech startups. So helping the existing economy, my personal experience because I was involved in that, it, that Europe was able to build some successful instruments of that kind. Uh, and I remember I was involved in that, the, Artemis Joint Undertaking Embedded Systems. So it's, it's an instrument which brings together industry in some domain. So therefore, embedded system, that is the automotive, bionics, uh, uh, medical systems, uh, and so on. Together, they put the industry uh, uh, in the driving seat of the instruments, and they say, okay, now we're going to organize your own uh, research and innovation uh, uh, projects. You fund them, and we help you to fund them through European money and also national money. And this was also the case in electronics. This was merged into Excel, uh, which is for microelectronics and what's called now cyber physical systems. It spends around, I'm not sure of the figures, but it's the order of magnitude, 2 billion of, of overall investment every three years. So let's say almost 1 billion a year. And this had some successes. Uh, for example, NXP, which is just Dutch company, was in very bad shape in the early, uh, uh, early 2010s. And now it's in much better shape. And this had an impact. This program has really an impact on that. So I know that there are some discussions with probably something around that, uh, uh, around that kind of idea for AI. And I believe that Europe should, should, should do that. Now, the question is, and this is much more difficult, how to create a European environment for the new AI-based economy. Uh, today, most people say, okay, we have startups, but we should uh, bring some more funding to the startups. I believe it's not sufficient because we have to look at the whole life cycle of a startup. The startup is created, it has some initial funding, several rounds of funding, and it has to find the right product fit, product market fit. In particular, for doing that, it has to find the channels for growth. Okay. Basically, when it's pure IT, the channel is digital marketing. But when it's not pure IT, and this is going to be the case for the bulk 
or the impact of AI on the economy, uh, you need other channels. For example, for the power system to equip the end consumer, that is buildings, industry, transportation, you need some channels to uh, address those people. It's not very digital, it won't work. So you need some cooperation with the people the, of the existing economy who are in those sectors. And of course, you need an exit. So an exit could be an IPO, or more often than not, you are acquired by a large company. But who in Europe is going to acquire uh, a successful startup at the level of like the low one or 10 billion? No one today. So for each of these steps in this kind of automaton, okay, we need to associate the existing players uh, uh, from the existing economy from project inception uh, uh, for finding the channel for growth and for exit. Now the question is what kind of game do we want to play in Europe? It's very simple in a sense. It's the level of exit of our startups. Do you want exit at 10 million, at 100 million, at 1 billion, 10 billion and so on? And if you look at uh, uh, the, 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 the funding amounts which are necessary for doing that, you have what's typically called in the VC term series A, B, C, and B. O. But if you look now at the level of involvement of these existing companies in that process, you see that for 10 billion, okay, it's in place. Every company now, large company, has an open innovation team. If you want to go up to the 100 million, then you need to involve the whole business unit. And I can tell you that it's much more difficult. From 1 billion up in the sea level. So it means that we need some incentive to raise the level of interest to this new economy inside the large companies. Things are happening in large companies. I'm not saying that nothing is happening. Things are happening. Nevertheless, I believe that it's the role of a, a, a government or a public body like, like, like the Commission to build incentives to change this environment. So we need to associate some existing players uh, and so on, that I said already. So one possibility to do that, yeah, just to insist on, on the difficulty of doing that, sorry. But there are a number of chicken and eggs problems huh? that we have better funded VCs or corporate funds, and we have better support for commercialization for existing players, and we have better exist if higher level is involved. That's what I said. But we also have better, more ambitious projects to fund if the game is bigger. And conversely, I have some friends who are in the process of building a one billion fund in AI, or VC fund in AI, okay? And they want to be at the Series B, that they want to fund around 20 projects at the level of 50 billion. Okay, in the next three years. But it's difficult to find a kind of project in Europe. Because simply, uh, uh, if it's not possible to have a kind of exit at the end, then the, the projects are less ambitious. So they, 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 there have been some positive steps in that direction. And for example, the European Parliament recently asked for instruments for funding non-bankable projects in innovation for startups. Uh, I would like just to mention uh, I'm also involved in that, that there is the IC pilot for the next two years, which now I bought from startups up to the level of 15 million, a true Series A. And there are also corporate funds which are being launched by European companies in the automotive sector, for example. But nevertheless, we will need some incentives. So this is just an idea that I am submit submitting, I, and you do whatever you want with that. We, we could think of a strategic European fund for, for AI startups, but which would involve uh, the existing economy. So it would federate in some sense, maybe a loose or, or a strong link with other corporate funds. Uh, the basic initial scheme, for example, would be, okay, large, we find 10 large companies who are able to uh, commit 300 million a year uh, to this kind of fund. There would be per year a uh, 1 million incentive from the European Investment Fund, and also 1 million from member states through various means. It could be also uh, fiscal incentives, for example, or the kind of stuff. Okay. So uh, uh, this will be an instrument, as I, I was saying, uh, for money, but also uh, as a kind of a sociological instrument, spare head, okay, 
to raise focus on innovation up to sea level and to learn to integrate, to help them to integrate acquisitions that would kill them, uh, to strongly connect to transformation and, and so on. And so, uh, uh, last remark about that. Remember what, why this is necessary. Why it's not possible to do that kind of innovation within existing companies. Uh, uh, so first of all, yes, uh, just as a model, when IT was born in the 60s, if you look at the domain at that time, and you look in particular at the silicon industry, people who make chips, one third of the market in the US was defense and space. This is why created IT and Moose Law. So we did something similar in Europe today with AI for all the domains, but not with defense and space, with all the domains. Uh, there is something which makes Europe absolutely uh, in good position for succeeding, which is that new AI-based products and services will be mainly embedded in the hardware. So very probably there will be no winner takes all, uh, 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 like we see in, IT, in pure IT. Uh, and the existing economy assets are key to growth, and we have that in Europe. So uh, any industrial domain today is potentially a defense and space support that I already said. And above all, developing new products and services require a different structure from the large company that we have today with slow decision cycles. You need shorter decision cycles. You need to make a decision of a new product or to try something on the market, maybe every two weeks, okay? And you need a close connection between R and the marketing. It's totally different from what, what's happening, which is why we need to have this innovation uh, uh, creating the new economy separated out but linked to uh, the existing economy. So to end up, I, I won't say much about the new basic technology developed using AI. Uh, a last point, a historical point. When, when you read the uh, uh, books in history regarding the form of industrial revolution, actually the transition was extremely difficult, extremely difficult socially, okay? When some technological change or historical magnitude happens, it's sometimes very difficult. But it also shows that those who miss the revolution have even harder times. So it's not a negative point or a pessimistic point I would like to make, but we absolutely need to tackle that to make the transition as smooth and uh, uh, as quick as possible. Of course, I've not talked about ethics and so on, which is uh, uh, a huge topic today in Europe. This is linked to that. I'm not talking about revolution. My illustration of Bansky is just to, uh, you see, uh, uh, today the, 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 the bad people are not so bad, it's just a teddy bear, so they are not so naughty. So that's all. Thank you. Uh, I've been uh, a little bit longer than expected. Uh, in fact, it was expected that I would be a little bit longer than expected. So your questions, and thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. for the very interesting. Yeah. Presentation. We have now here some kind of echo. Uh, yes, I have some questions uh, from the audience. And I myself also, of course, have questions. Most concretely, I start with Jose, Jose, <laughs> not Jose, Jose, he asked. I'd like to know your views on the broader aspects of AI in Europe. There are a widespread idea in some circles that Europe perhaps is too dependent on foreign technology when it comes to AI. What are you take on that? What are the potential consequences of the risk dependency for European business, governments and citizens? How can we overcome the situation? That's Jose's questions. Okay, so uh, can you repeat the, the beginning of the question? You, you were mentioning dependencies of Europe regarding AI technology, right? Yeah, and he's basically in the beginning saying there's like we are getting too dependent and do you think this is so? Are we are too dependent on other countries, continents? What are the potential consequences of this dependency, of this risk? Well, we, we are dependent on IT, that's true. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
uh, up to now, regarding AI, I, I don't believe the, the, the game has not been played yet. Mm -hmm. We're not that much dependent. Well, in a practical way, if I want to uh, embed some uh, AI application in some product, okay, I'm going probably going to use uh, some environments made in the US, in TensorFlow or whatever. It could be also uh, I could be also using Scikit, huh, for example, which is uh, uh, an environment uh, which has been made partly in Europe. Okay, mm -hmm. but it's not that a serious problem, you know. The, the real serious problems are going to come when the products embedded there are going to come to, to be there. Yeah. And so the dependency is going to be on the competence. Do we have the brains to do that? Yes. Mm -hmm. But we don't know how to organize them. So mm -hmm. we have to learn how to organize those brains in order to, to make the, those new products or to improve uh, the way today's products are made. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, of course, it's also the case for chips, for example. The first startup we created makes uh, very high performance chips, Calore. Uh, Europe is not the first in the world regarding chips. But uh, we are not in that bad a situation. That's what I was mentioning. We've been able to uh, uh, make programs like Excel, for example, which improve uh, the situation. And now we have a chip industry which makes it possible, for example, for the automotive or health sector to be relatively independent from the yeah. So it's not the case for the high-end chips that mm -hmm. are in smartphones, for example, but, but it's the case for that. And mm -hmm. when we created Canada with some friends, we had the objective of having a European company which could outcompete the others uh, with very high per performance and today AI uh, required this benefit. This performance. Mm -hmm. So, so the dependency on candidates is not that high today. Of course, it's going to to happen in the future if we do nothing. We are going to be dependent, but today, no. My message is not a message of, of pessimism. Mm -hmm. Just the contrary. I'm just trying to analyze things and to say the story is going to be different from IT. Yeah. Because we are going to enter the, the existing economy. We must organize and learn to do things that we, are, we have not been good at doing up to now. Mm -hmm. This in the economy, okay, this startup stuff and so on. Uh, nevertheless, we have the basic resources for doing that. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think we also, maybe at the beginning anyway, uh, for the commercial product. There comes a new question one more from the um, participants please enter more questions if you have any i um, have a second from mia and she asked you john john Lu, can you comment on a need for transparent and open ai technologies to overcome merely industrial bias of such technologies transfer of open ai technology that's right uh, it's like uh, is there a need for transparent transparent and open okay. AI technologies to overcome merely industrial bias of such technologies? Well, I don't know exactly what, what, what the, the question is meaning. If transparency is uh, uh, in the relationship between the industry which is making product, making products with respect to, to its customers. It's, as a customer, I would like to know what's inside the product. I would like to be uh, deceived by the producer in some way, you know, for example, they would steal my my, uh, uh, my private data or, or whatever, this is one thing. Uh, yeah, of course, some rules are going to, to be necessary for that. And also very programming some technology, uh, but it, the case in many sectors, in particular in Europe, also in, in other continents, but probably more in Europe than, than elsewhere, where more and more uh, uh, aware and concerned by uh, what's really inside the product, okay? This pesticide, for example, uh, stuff, okay? So it's very, going to be the same with AI. Mm -hmm. I, my opinion is not, it's not a reason at all to uh, reject any, any AI embedded in, pro in, in product, okay? Uh, but, okay, this is one point. Uh, being transparent uh, could also mean that there is some concerted, some federation of efforts which is necessary uh, probably among industrial domains 
this is probably true. Uh, there are some, some platforms and some solutions which are probably necessary in the automotive sector, in the health sector, in transportation, in construction, in where, wherever. Some basic technology, some infrastructure. For example, I was mentioning this requirement. We, we need some platform to bring together the data from various players, but who would like to keep those data confidential. Nevertheless, mm -hmm. to have some level of use of those data to together make some meaningful AI application. Okay. Mm -hmm. This kind of platform is necessary. And that Hub Francia, there, there is a, such a project, I believe, that there are the projects in Europe mm -hmm. in that direction. So this is where probably uh, uh, industry has to share something. And, and so it means that the, the, the public bodies, uh, such as the member states or, or the European Commission, certainly ha have to do have something to do in that area. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes. And I would like now to basically also say that, I mean, we, we in Europe, we heard it together when we were in this AI assembly um, conference in Brussels, you and me, Jean-Luc, <laughs> uh, that they said, okay, we have a competitive edge in Europe because on trustworthy AI. Do you agree? Oh, yeah, agree? of course. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, there are, it's one idea, but there are, I believe, two facets of the idea. Uh, one facet is to say that we have some researchers working on that to develop technology to achieve this trust for the AI. And also we have, a, I would say, a general environment for doing that. Legal environment, uh, citizens mm -hmm. are concerned, uh, high level people uh, uh, in the public bodies in particular are really interested in that. And also that doing that uh, will be a competitive advantage with, with the others. Very mm -hmm. probably, yes. Very probably, yes, because like any technology, AI can have a, a, a good side and a dark side, okay? Uh, and the dark side is, is of course, always very tempting. Uh, so um, if Europe is able both to define what is trustworthy AI and at the same time to make it, it's mm -hmm. not just to define what it should be, but we also have yeah. to make it, then it's yeah. a, probably a winning strategy. Yeah. And the winning strategy, I don't mean in, in terms of, of competition with the others, it's also a winning strategy for the others. I'm a humanist and I'm not uh, in favor of too strong competition between, uh, <laughs> between the people. Mm -hmm. Okay. I seem to but I would insist, nevertheless, on the fact that, okay, let's define it, but let's make it. Mm -hmm. Because if it's just words, it's going to be worth very little. Yes. Good. Then we are coming to the end of the show today. Sorry enough, but I have one more question from, uh, but it has to be quick because I want to say goodbye to everybody. Uh, so here is Aisha. Aisha, she asked, how about your slide on schema for a new instrument? My question is about the strategic EU fund. Is this related to the call for proposals for the AI for EU project or to other calls? Also, when. No, I did not mean it to be related to some specific call. I mean, it's just a general idea, general schema. And you can do whatever you want out of this. <laughs> okay. No problem. So now, uh, just if you want to, to continue the discussion and so on, uh, you can have my email. It's very easy. Or you go to LinkedIn or whatever, uh, and we can exchange your emails. No problem. Yes, great. So this is I'm now changing back to me as presenter because I'm going to show the last slide. And basically, this cafe encourage you to get it directly in contact with Jean-Luc. If you feel like you're interested in more details, you have more questions, please write to him. You will find also this PowerPoint basically on the, I mean, you will basically find all the information about this session on the AI for EU platform. And we basically now, it's like 3.57, I would like to encourage you 
to come to the next session, which is, one moment, I hope you see it soon. It will be AI for EU strategic vision. The speakers will be Michela Milano from University of Bologna and Sonia Silner from Siemens. These both ladies um, are the, the leader of this uh, vision of this uh, paper, for, uh, but of course, everybody is uh, welcome to give comments. And the registration you find for this next web session also on the AI for EU platform. So feel free to come. And my last wish, as I'm organizing soon weekly even these web sessions in the cafe, please suggest topics or yourself as speaker or somebody you would like to hear. It's an open cafe. It would be great to have a wide variety of speakers and topics. So thank you for joining. There are a lot of people today here and see you next time. Thank you, Jean-Luc again. Thank you for doing this great presentation. We will talk further <laughs> afterwards. Okay. okay, have a nice afternoon and bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.